from our experiments which i'll exemplify by three stories the topic i've chosen today is data to discovery in information security there are two parts to this talk the first part is to tell you the explosion of data and i'm going to tell you there is a concept called the revenge of silicon topic that uh, you know i have been uh, contemplating you know as not only a research as a researcher but also as a person heading an institute the title is basically the 13th uh, to 21st century the saga of science and i represent uh, indian institute of chemical technology just to give you today my title of my talk is philosophy of ultimate success in scientific life title i was saying is something about the art of science uh, in the time of covid 19 and beyond and something like the brave new world uh, the new millennium i work on srm university andhra pradesh amravati was born to offer a unique learning experience to deliver cutting edge education to foster innovation and to create the leaders of tomorrow sprawled over 200 acres the university has been designed by the world renowned architecture firm perkins and will the lush green eco-friendly campus provides a conducive environment to learning and creativity SRM University Andhra Pradesh Amravati is a multi-stream research university with focus on diverse fields including engineering medicine liberal arts and management it offers a rich selection of graduate and undergraduate programs across faculties What's more, the faculty is highly qualified, experienced and has global exposure to mentor and support the students every step of the way. The university is currently working on developing a hydrogen fuel cell based train. Hello everyone. I am VS Rao, Vice Chancellor of SRM University AP. SRM University AP was established in the year 2017. under the ap private university act we offer degree programs in engineering science liberal arts and management we have extensive collaborations with well reputed universities all over the world like uc berkeley university of wisconsin medicine and national university of singapore our students spend a semester abroad during their educational years today we have around 3200 students pursuing their undergraduate programs postgraduate programs and phd the university has laid strong emphasis on research right from the beginning as a result today we have more than 80 phd students with more than 200 publications in the in high impact journals by our faculty with 18 published patents and Uh, 18 crore worth research funding from various governmental agencies we have collaboration with amar raja batteries for establishing a center of uh, excellence in uh, energy storage we are also working on 3d printing of gold jewelry so like this the university is pursuing research entrepreneurship along with its excellence in teaching this year we have taken a fresh initiative to start university distinguished lecture series this is essentially to inspire our students faculty and also the scientists and the faculty across the country 
So we have many eminent people who have delivered the lectures in various niche areas of science, engineering, and humanities. SR University, Andhra Pradesh, is a multi-stream and research-intensive university. Research activities in frontline and the emerging areas of science and technology are being carried out at this university. A few examples being development of a hydrogen-powered fuel cell-based train in association with the Ministry of Railways, and also SRM Amar Raja Center for Energy Storage Devices, focusing on fast charging of lithium-ion batteries, 3D printing of lithium-ion electrons, electrodes, and also to look beyond lithium ion. Thus, SRM University AP has taken an initiative to organize University Distinguished Lecture Series. And the first lecture was delivered by the most illustrious scientist, Professor Ajay Sood of the Indian Institute of Science, who is a fellow of the Royal Society and well known for his contributions in nanoscience and nanotechnology. The University Distinguished Lectures are being organized in such a way that the faculty members, the research scholars, and students of SRM University, AP will get benefited. Also, these lectures are being attended by large gathering of participants from several premier institutions, universities in the country and abroad. We are receiving messages from them that the distinguished lectures are of immense benefit and they are in fact asking us to organize a few more. Thus, we are quite happy that the initiative of SRM AP is being well received and is being well utilized by the faculty members, research scholars. So this uh, first slide actually are the videos from our experiments, which I'll exemplify by three stories. The topic I've chosen today is data to discovery in information security. There are two parts to this talk. The first part is to tell you the explosion of data. And I'm going to tell you there is a concept called the revenge of silicon. Topic that, uh, you know, I have been uh, contemplating, you know, as not only a research, as a researcher, but also as a person heading an institute. The title is basically the 13th uh, to 21st century, the saga of science. And I represent uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, just to give you... Today, my title of my talk is Philosophy of Ultimate Success in Scientific Life. The title, I was saying, is something about the art of science uh, in the time of COVID-19 and beyond, and something like the brave new world, uh, the new millennium, SRM University, Andhra Pradesh, Amaravati was born to offer a unique learning experience, to deliver cutting-edge education, to foster innovation and to create the leaders of tomorrow. Sprawled over 200 acres, the university has been designed by the world-renowned architecture firm Perkins and Will. Uh, hello, Professor Ganesh. Oh, hello, Professor Narayana. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we are so happy that. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, sir. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. You will meet soon, maybe uh, in the Downing Body meeting. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I see. Your uh, meeting coming up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We uh, will discuss with our vice chancellor and management sure. and sure. schedule the meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. This is uh, V. S. Rao. Oh, hello. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. We met in uh, Aishar uh, Pune. That's right. Yeah. You know, I had in another very close uh, colleague in uh, Aishar Pune. He is also Professor V. S. Rao. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who was a mentor uh, looking after while Aishar Tirupati was being established? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Sir, how many Swarnadhyayanthi fellowships you got from Aishar Tirupati? Two. Yeah, Balraman. Balraman and uh, uh, Arvindan. Yeah, yeah. Sir, Balraman, to start with, he joined at SRM Chennai. Yes, yes, I see. Ah, <laughs> then he moved to NPA, NCL. Mm -hmm. From NCL, yeah. Yeah, he has joined. Uh, but you got, uh, you brought very good people, sir. Yes, you know, I'm very happy because our senior colleague, Vijay Mohanan, is also very nice. Yeah, very, correct, correct. Yeah. You know, getting such experienced people to mentor young faculty yes. is very mm -hmm. Similarly, in biology, also have Professor B. J. Rao, who came from TIFR, mm -hmm. a very mm -hmm. accomplished, you know, biologist, fellows of all academy, etc. Uh, yeah. so we've been very lucky, mm -hmm. and very soon we'll be having uh, uh, one Dr. Ramesh Sonti uh, from CCMB. He's in plant sciences, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll probably be joining us. So that's mm -hmm. another good thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you need such uh, illustrious mentors. Mm. You know, it was not the case at Iser Pune. I could mm. not be near people at all. But I see. Uh, because ISIS were not known. Mm, mm. But today, you know, the, we have that advantage at Tirupati. Correct, correct. Yeah. yeah. ISIS are well known now throughout the world. <laughs> <laughs> see, because of the faculty and their accomplishments through quality publications. Right. You know, that's, that's the only way institutions will get to know. Yeah, so yeah. So when you ask, I thought, you know, let me share my... Uh, some you know experience of institution building, and mm. that's the reason I gave this uh, title. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, institution building. building. Yeah. No, no. I was telling my it's younger apt, colleagues. Sir. It's an apt topic for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Ganesh, I was telling my younger colleagues. Yeah. Professor Ganesh, as a director, I said Pune in the beginning, he hired apartments nearby. And said, "These are your uh, laboratories." <laughs> and I, I gave a similar example of uh, Dr. Vikram Saravai when he wanted to start mm. in Trivandrum. He uh, took one dilapidated church and uh, started functioning ISRO. Yes. You know, all great institutions have started like that. Yes, sir. And I still remember ISRO. Mm. You know, the very first rocket, what they mm. made, mm. was mm. being taken in a cycle. So you can, correct. <laughs> you know, for the launching site, they were correct. actually taken by bicycle. So, Tumba rocket launching station, TRLS, yes. it was taken by a bicycle. Bicycle, yeah. And also, uh, a satellite was carried by a bullock cart. Bullock cart. <laughs> uh, unless we show the picture, That's my right. younger <laughs> colleagues may ridicule me. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But uh, as you said, I, sir, I hope my slides would come out okay. Uh, yeah, I think they will check uh, it. Somebody sir. said they will check my slides. Uh, who Murali? Is that now or? Are we not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we can check the slides. Yeah, please. So I had to share the slides, right? Yes, sir. Is it coming okay now? Yes, sir. Fine, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. Okay, let me just put in the full screen mode. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I think it's getting cut and all that. No, no, sir. No, no, no. Excellent. Okay, good. Yeah. Sir, we have taken this uh, uh, University Distinct Lecture uh, Series initiative. Since yes. October, we have organized seven lectures. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, you know, all with, uh, you know, I'm very privileged to join that group. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know, they may be privileged to join with you. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. yeah. No, you started with the very first one with Professor Rao, you know, you started and... Uh, uh, Ajay Sood. Yeah, Ajay Sood. And then Ajay Professor Sood. Rao also gave one. Right? Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was a webinar in the month of May, correct? Ah, right, 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 right. Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. 
that was a large gathering more than 3500 participants <laughs> <laughs> cnr is known everywhere yeah. yeah you know there is one advantage of these uh, webinars and this kind of meetings yeah, yeah. So you reach out to large number of people you know correct sir yeah no that day when professor nar rao gave talk afterwards astho uh, sharma gave yeah uh, somebody asked he said has it ever happened 3500 people meeting yeah. together hmm. he said there is one advantage of covid 19 absolutely then we should take hmm. advantage of this technology and you know hmm. uh, do that yeah. correct sir professor nar rao i remember 31st may yeah right right you know probably after sir. that he is not he didn't give any webinar Oh, okay, okay. Maybe there's only one, you know, which he went on a webinar thing. No, when I talked to him, Narendra, I don't know what is that. I have not used. I said, sir, your office staff will help you. Otherwise, I'll send somebody. Hmm. Then he said, okay, okay. You no, know, for him the shock was how to talk to a screen. Yeah, yeah, correct. correct <laughs> Without seeing correct. people, that was his main uh, thing. Correct, you know? correct. Yeah, hmm. never done that. So. So I'll tell you in 2011 Science Congress yeah. that afternoon, Professor Nar was giving a talk. Mm. Our auditorium at Chennai is huge. Mm. By seeing 4,000 participants, he told me, "Nar and Rao, I am also becoming nervous." <laughs> <laughs> By seeing, he said, "I have not given a talk to such large gathering. Yeah, that in two minutes will get adjusted." <laughs> But you know that is one thing. Here we don't have that fear of audience. You don't know whether there are two or two thousand. You know, you will you'll never get to know them. You'll never get to see them. So only they will be seeing you. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So how is it? Your students are all coming back to the campus, or uh, no, sir? Right now uh, we are thinking of calling them next to semester. okay batches mm mm-hmm. so still we are uh, debating on that how yeah. to organize the entire thing yeah we we got about 160 students mainly phd integrated phd and the bsms students they all come to the campus uh, we are exercising all caution but luckily till now no yeah, yeah. <laughs> incidents of you know covid things so we started you know now a lot of students want to come they have been writing we are bored at home we want to come to the campus we have also called phd students yes and so, we are also exercising extreme caution mm-hmm. following that uh, all the uh, sop yes we get us hope things will work out then the numbers increase uh, in the month of january uh, number of students coming to campus mm mm-hmm. ఎవరిబడి professor ganesh the distinguished speaker of uh, today's series professor uh, narayan rao garu pro vice chancellor of srm university and the organizing team who have actually taken the initiative of starting this university distinguished lecture series distinguished participants faculty students staff press and media i welcome you all to the seventh distinguished lecture now uh, going to be delivered today by professor k n ganesh director of 
I said, Tirupati. Sir, we are indeed honored to have you deliver the lecture on pursuit of excellence, institutional building. Uh, the topic is very apt to your excellent accomplishments as the first and founding director of ICER Pune. You have provided great leadership in institutional building to establish the ICER's brand in science, education, and research institutes. Now, they are attaining international recognition. I remember Professor D. Balasubramanian, sir, was uh, discussing about this at the conception stage to understand how Bitspilani was offering dual degree programs. So this was at the time of uh, the design of ICERS, maybe 2003, 4, I don't remember exactly. You are also the mental director of the sixth ICER at Tirupati from February 2015, and you have assumed charge as full-time director from November 2017. Sir, you have the rare and unique distinction of being the first and founder director of two ICERs, Pune and Tirupati. That is the reason why I said the topic is very apt. To mention briefly about his background, after completing his education at reputed institutions with a double PhD from University of Delhi and University of Cambridge, Professor Ganesh joined CCMB Hyderabad in 1981. He established India's first micro synthesis DNA facility, initiating a vigorous research program to discover new motives of DNA protein interactions. In 1987, he relocated to National Chemical Laboratory, where he became the head of organic chemistry division in 1994. Professor Ganesh has made excellent research contribution to chemistry and biology of nucleic acids, focusing on therapeutic and diagnostic applications of DNA analogs structural biology of collagen peptides and emerging areas of DNA nanotechnology. He is internationally recognized for his original and creative contributions to design of peptides, nucleic acids, analogs for effective cell permeation. Professor Ganesh is also a fellow of three science academies in India and also a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, TWS. He has served as a member of the editorial advisory boards of various journals, including Journal of Organic Chemistry. He is currently a member of Nanoscience Advisory Group of DST Nanoscience Mission, chairman of DBT Task Force on Nanobiotechnology, Chairman, Finance Committee of India Alliance, Welcome Trust DBT. He is the recipient of several awards. Prominent among them is Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in Chemical Sciences, 1998. We are indeed fortunate to have such a towering personality deliver the seventh university distinguished lecture at SRM University AP, which is committed to the pursuit of excellence. The SRM University AP has laid a strong emphasis on research right from its inception. As a result, today, we have faculty with good research accomplishments focusing on UG and PG programs resulting in good number of publications, more than 300 publications in high impact journals, around 18 patents published or filed, and several government and industry funded projects. In the very first three years, 
with a view to encourage our faculty and students and also benefit the overall academic ecosystem. We started this initiative of University Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm sure many young scientists, faculty and students get inspired and immensely benefited with these lectures in niche and important areas. Sir, so far we have conducted six university distinguished lecture series and received a very good response from academia and research institutions. With these words, I would like to thank Professor Ganesh for accepting to deliver the lecture and also all the distinguished participants for their presence. Thank you very much, sir. Now I invite our uh, distinguished speaker uh, to deliver the lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor V.S. Rao for your kind words of introduction. I must also thank uh, Narayan Rao Garu, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor for inviting me to give this talk. And I have been associated with SRM University as a member of their council. And I've visited the Institute and I'm very happy to see that the Institute has recruited a lot of young, good faculty trying to create research ambience with a very good management system. And Dr. Narayan Rao's own initiative and experience has helped SRM University in quickly coming up to, uh, into one of the good private institutions. And their emphasis on research is very noteworthy. They have research in several areas, as I have seen, right from biology to nanotechnology. And I did meet some of the young faculty. I wish next time I will visit, I will have more opportunity to interact with the faculty. And again, I'm very happy to be giving this talk and uh, in particular to join a very distinguished panel of the predecessors who have given this talk. I'm highly privileged to be giving this seventh uh, talk of the distinguished lecture series. Uh, when I was asked to give this talk, I was wondering whether I should talk about my science or something else. You know, then I didn't want to because the audience would be very diverse. There will be students, faculty, and several people. So I thought I should share some of my experience of institution building. Uh, with my experience of about now close to about 15 years since I have been with the ICERS, I thought that I could just share some experience of what it takes to build an institution. We all talk about world-class institutions. We all talk about excellence institutions. Everybody talks about that. Mm -hmm. But do we know at all what it takes to build one such institution? Mm -hmm. So based on my experience, I have put in some bit of you know, slides and I hope uh, that you will all get benefited by this word, these words and experience. So let me now share my screen. Uh, is it uh, visible? I hope it is visible to all of you. Not yet, sir. Not yet. No, 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 not as yet. Not yet. Not it. What else I had to do? Okay. Yeah, what about now? Yes, 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 fine. Fine, okay. sir. Okay. So, you know, these days the buzzword is excellence. Where does it start? What do we mean by excellence? Let me start with those principles. Now, what is excellence? Let us look at the definition of excellence. Now, going back to an old dictionary by Samuel Johnson, you know, excellence, the dictionary definition is to have good qualities to a great degree, to be eminent, to be great. The Oxford Dictionary defines excellence as the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. So the good, the word good comes to a great degree in these things, in these definitions. But excellence is very easy to define. You know, the dictionary is defined, but if you probe a little bit into what is excellence, excellence is easy to define, but it is very difficult to achieve. But even more, the problem is once you are there at the excellence, it is more difficult to sustain it at that level. That is much more than even reaching to the excellence. It is the most unstable state of a dynamic equilibrium. You know, the least thing you can come down from excellence to the next lower degree. 
what it takes to be there is a constant sustenance nurturing sustenance is very very important unless we understand what it takes to reach there and what it takes to remain there is very very difficult to be in the excellence category now let us look at what is the common thread of excellence in institutions now it can happen excellence at two levels one is from the individual driven the second one is the institute driven now when one goes into history many times it finds that the excellence is a result of the conviction and determination of a single individual many times individuals have changed the institutions when they are a champion he is driven by a champion who demonstrate through his personal example and commitment and he would show how important goals can be articulated how the necessary resources have to be assembled and how to embed true scholarship that enhances the educational experiences and in this sense institution becomes excellent because of two communities that is students and faculty the top down approach is you have already an institution the top down you have the leadership and they are so excellent that it percolates down to the institutional organization and finally to the individual level the other way is you have excellent individuals who give excellence to the department and then it transmits to the institute so it could be a top down or a bottom up approach but the individual still plays a very very important in bringing the institute the way in which i have structured my talk is what i am going to tell you is initially recollect history of excellent institutions to understand what it takes to re, you know reach excellence then tell you about why we require excellence of science institutes because that is where i have been working and then i'm going to very briefly tell you about the story of isas that they are now in existence for close to 14 or 15 years and what have been their collective impact and achievements and then finally end up by giving some definition of world class everybody talks about world class you know what exactly is that this is the plan of my talk so let us start with some history lessons from history now one thing i have to say it very very loudly is that what is that that have survived the history and the civilization of past several thousands of years and if you look into that it is only the academic institutions that have survived for centuries even today you know we talk about takshashila and i will give you more examples we don't talk of about a businessman or so much of a king but the institutions <laughs> that survive for thousands and thousands of years that is a very very important thing if you want to leave any legacy it is only in terms of the stamp of building good academic institutions now takshashila most of you know it was there when alexander the great came in the 4th century bc it was destroyed by nomadic hunans in 5th century it produced great teachers why do you remember takshashila is not just because of takshashila it is because of people like chanakya who wrote the art of arthashastra you know the economics or panini who wrote the grammar or charaka the ayurvedic healer it is these people who made the institution excellent or great then followed by nalanda in 427 to 1197 buddhist studies so in india we feel very proud of takshashila and nalanda and then if you go, go forward then we have institutions like oxford cambridge harvard and stanford they all remained excellent institutions and if you see you know when they were established you know oxford for example 1096 you know it is close to more than 1000 close to about 1000 years or less than that is the oldest in england cambridge harvard and even after having established having such rich history even today they are competing to be number 1 in terms of excellence that clearly tells you what it takes you know even after that much of history and achievements still they are struggling today to remain in the top that is the excellence now let us take one by one takkasila that is a pronunciation i learned which means is a cut stone sila is stone city of cut stone you know chanakya was a very famous scholar a teacher a philosopher economist jurist and he advised the king chandragupta maurya and he wrote the treatise on arthashastra we discusses the monetary and the fiscal policies welfare international you can remember you can you please remember this was at that time you know he could write about the economic science and then we had charaka who wrote this charaka samhita which is 
the principal is a contributor to ayurveda a system of medicine and lifestyle which even today you know we look uh, uh, look up to and then panini is a 5th century ancient sanskrit philologist in fact he is a grammarian and he is called as the father of linguistics so it is these people who made takshila i have only given a few scholars name so one is institutions are important and they become excellent because of the scholars that they produce next in nalanda which is the ancient magadha empire it flourished under the patronage of gupta empire and it attracted scholars and students at that time you know in 427 um, century it was already international people from tibet china korea and central asia they all came there to show some pictures of the campus you know uh, is very very interesting architectural things because we are building institutions today and there a lot of learn to look at the architectural designs of these institutions and who made that very famous was aryabhata all of you have know about aryabhata you know look at the what are the things aryabhata did explanation of lunar eclipse and solar eclipse rotation of earth and its axis reflection of light by moon sinusoidal functions solutions of single variable quadratic equation now many of us become not even become famous in one of these kind of things but he established these areas concepts value of pi correct to four decimal places is a fantastic thing at that time and even calculated the diameter of earth these are the kind of scholars that these institutions produced now let us jump about 1000 years or so oxford university 1096 you know it has 38 constituent colleges this shows a beautiful aerial view of oxford various academic departments and you can see you know it may be plus or minus 2 or 3 in terms of nobel they have produced 17 nobel laureates and three field medalists as you know in mathematics field medalist is the highest honor uh, a mathematician can get recognition and they have produced three field medalists 17 nobel laureates and if you look at it oxford has produced in the modern era three prime ministers william gladstone margaret thatcher uh, and uh, uh, theresa may and below if you see the kind of influential leaders you know institutions why they become excellent you know these are the people who make them excellent they produce they create conditions in which they can produce these kind of people influential leaders you know not only within england but many of these people went and became the prime ministers and you know heads of states of other countries um you know uh, uh, from anung san kyu indira gandhi we know about bill clinton stephen hawking a very famous scientist you know tim barnes lee dorothy hodgkin a very famous crystallographer and in the modern era roger penrose you see and he got nobel prize this year i'm sure all of you remember roger penrose who got nobel prize michael athaya very very famous mathematician unfortunately passed away a couple of years back and our own former prime minister manmohan singh it is these people who made this place excellent that was about oxford i'm only giving you glimpse of why institutions become famous you know what does it take you know to become excellent then you go to cambridge university which was actually started by some rebels moving from oxford you know many of these universities started with some religious theology as a the major thing and some rebels from oxford moved to cambridge to start the university in 1209 and look at the kind of people which cambridge university you know this is the king's college what you see is a very famous college picture and isaac newton charles darby you know they're all the household names paul dirac francis crick james watson and the cavendish lab alone produced you know the whole of you know physics the modern physics and modern biology started from there and bragg the crystallographer you know the father and the son pay amartya sen you know a roman economist who got nobel prize and venki ramakrishnan all these people thrived in the cambridge you know there must be something about the place about the institution that brings the best in people and cambridge surpasses oxford it has only 118 nobel prizes out of it 32 is in physics 26 in medicine 25 in chemistry 11 in economics and one college of cambridge alone trinity college has 33 nobel laureates and you can imagine you know we all talk about excellence look at the history you know what it takes and what it is to be in such institutions then we move on to the us side harvard you have only picked up a few of them to sort of give an idea about what is the kind of excellence that we are talking about harvard university you know 
some distinguished alumni it has produced, I'm sure many faces you recognize here. Harvard University has produced eight United States presidents, and it also has produced 18 heads of states, you know, elsewhere, you know, the president and prime ministers of other countries. Harvard has 159 Nobel Prizes, physics 29, chemistry 35, physiology, medicine, economics, literature, peace, and you know, all of you know about these kind of influential thinkers, Kissinger, Al Gore. You know, it is not just the scientists. The excellence institutions produce scholars, people who can influence others in terms of their thinking. That is one hallmark of you know, excellence. Now, coming to Indian connections in Harvard, I'm sure all of you recognize all of you recognize these uh, faces here. Indian connections, you know, Ratan Tata and uh, Mittal. Bajaj, and of course, I'm sure you know about Abhijit Mukherjee. And very strangely, you will find, if you go to Wikipedia, you also find that this face, Karina was also, you know, I just put it in the lighter vein, also has, you know, Harvard connection. That's about Harvard University. Now, I have not, uh, you know, I can always talk about Princeton, Yale, et cetera, but I have just given you some glimpse of what it takes, how you measure excellence by, from the people who produce, you know, are produced by the institutions. Now, let us get to the Indian scene. In pre-independence era, we also had excellent institutions. And for example, University of Calcutta in 1857, you know, the 24th January University of Calcutta was established. And I mean, I'm a little bit, I'm exaggerating, you know, not only just University of Calcutta, but you take Calcutta as a city, at least it has been responsible for five Nobel laureates uh, you know, right from Ronald Ross, Rabindranath Tagore, C. V. Raman, Amartya Sen, now latest Abhijit Banerjee, and we can also put Mother Teresa, who received Nobel Prize for her work in Calcutta. This was the pre-independence, and of course, Abhijit Banerjee and Amartya Sena, Sen are post-independence. Uh, of course, they all had moved out of, you know, Calcutta, but there must be something in that region which sort of oozes, you know, that kind of uh, eminence from people. And then University of Madras, you know, it is also in 1857, you see, of course, we also remember 1857, because that is a year in which we had our first, you know, uh, war of independence, and uh, Britishers call it Sipai Mutiny, but we call it first war of independence. And University of Madras, you know, that produced C.V. Raman, yes, Ramanujan, yes, Radha Krishna, and G.N. Ramachandran, and of course, recently, Madras also has, Chennai has produced very many, you know, corporate uh, Microsoft or, you know, other corporate uh, leaders just produced. And then we had India's of Science Bangalore, more than 100 years old. And James H. G. Tata was the, you know, he took the initiative of that. Banaras Hindu University, nobody can forget about that, 1916, Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya, you know, he built that. And there are several nice stories about how Malaviya went about, uh, you know, building Banaras Hindu Universities. One quote is that the millions mired in poverty here can only get rid of it when science is used in their interest. Such maximum application of science is only possible when scientific knowledge is available to Indians in their own country. This is a statement he made uh, for Banaras Hindu University. And then we also had Annamalai University, uh, you know, founded by Annamalai Chettiar, is the first private university in Tamil Nadu. Uh, it is a philanthropy which was done in his mother's name. And so these were the India in pre-independence. We did have during the British time, many of these institutions did crop up who became very, very famous. But what about post-independence? Have we been able to do some institutions like this after we got independence? Punjab University, you know, it moved from Lahore to Hoshiarpur in Chandigarh, is one of the top universities today, although it is a state university. Then we established several IITs, you know, the first generation, Kharagpur, Bombay, Madras, Kanpur, Delhi, Gauhati, Roorkee, IITs came up, and the second generation IITs came up in 2008, nine, and now more have come up. University of Hyderabad, Central University came up in 1974, Pondicherry University in 1985, and several new central universities were initiated in 2009, and around the same time, ISIS also started, you know, like Calcutta, Pune, Mohali, Bhopal. Now there are seven ISIS. I will talk about them a little bit later. Now, what happened to these institutions? Have they been able to thrive based on their, ex, you know, excellence, what they built? For example, Tatsushila and Nalanda, if you take, they flourished for centuries, they attracted scholars, but then they suddenly disappeared. 
Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, they continue to thrive and are among the top academic institutions. You know, every year, the Times ranking or whatever it is, you look at the top institutions, the top 10, you can never replace them. It is only the change of order. You know, they're struggling to be one, two, three. Uh, you know, you cannot replace those 10. They just stay there. But it's, it itself takes a lot of struggle from these uh, uh, universities to stay on the top and to be among the top 10 or even one, two, or three. They continue to thrive. And one can see that what is common uh, between them later on. Now, in India, what happened to Calcutta, Madras, BHU, Anamalai, they were all great at one time, but today they're not the leading institution. They still have a lot of, you know, old charm left, but you cannot consider them as, uh, you know, among the leading institutions in the country. IASC had its ups and downs. I hope nobody takes an exception to my sentence. It is all relative when I make it. Industry of Science, 100 year old plus, it had its ups and downs, it is doing well, and it has survived even after 100 years, that is the best institution in the India, in, in our country, you know, IASC. So there are a lot of things to learn from how the IAC is organized and how can it reach much higher. IITs, they have shot up to prominence in 1990s and many of their alumni became successful businessmen, successful scholars, some alumni became good academicians too, and they are very, very still remain as high profile institutions. So the excellent institutions, they're, you know, they have the path they have in the future, it is always being checked. Now, if you look at some of these institutions in India and why they became famous, you will find one common quality, that is quality of faculty. You know, nobody can question. Institution is made up of quality of faculty. And if institution managers, if they forget about that, they can never bring their institutions on the top because quality faculty begets quality students. And there is a very famous saying that Nobel laureates used to go and join uh, Princeton because they get the best of the students there. And the students would join the university because they have the best of the teachers. Now that is the ideal situation. You know, students and teachers, each one weighing, you know, to be uh, together. Now, if you look at this Indian institutions, BHU, Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya went around skiting for talent for BHU. And BHU had great scholars, you know, that's how it became famous in the pre-independence period. P.K. Kelkar, who established IIT Kanpur, he went around scouting for talented faculty, and you know about Kanpur, you know, the legacy which he left, you know, particularly I know about chemistry, how Kanpur, and even today, sort of the top IITs. A.C. Joshi at Punjab University, again, he went for excellent faculty, and he appointed great scholars, and M.S. Randava was one of them. Ashutosh Mukherjee at Calcutta University, he appointed Raman as a pilot professor. And C. V. Raman himself at IAC appointed K. S. Krishnan in preference to Meghnad Saha. A. N. Ja at Ahabad, he actually appointed Erwin Schrodinger you know, when Saha left. And C. V. Raman also appointed Prantl, Max Bone at IAC because he was keen to have faculty of Nobel class. And in the recent times, you know, Central University of you know, Hyderabad, Professor Gurubak Singh who was the first vice chancellor, he appointed quality faculty. You know, many of these people are the founders of the institutions. What was their first preference to make the institutions great is appointing the best of the faculty. That is the most, most important thing. Now, coming back to excellence, has the meaning of excellence changed over the years? What we used to call as excellence 100 years back, is it the same today? Now, 21st century context, the excellence has to be combined about with the word relevance also. Now, because we have increased and improved science and technology and to drive social and economic development. Today, that is very, very important to use SNT based solutions. So that is where the relevance comes in. So we need to be excellent and also we need to be relevant. And developing solutions to social problems, that is where the relevance comes. And that is a new grammar of modern science. Today, you will not get funding if you do not show the relevance of your work. You know, there is a new grammar of modern sciences relevance. Now to position India amongst the top five global scientific powers through excellence, is it possible? We had this science and technology policy, science and technology innovation, uh, you know, initiative. We had several policy documents. All of them, you know, they do mention how we need to strive to put India among the top global scientific powers. But is it just a wishful thinking or we actually believe that we can do that? That is a question we need to ask. 
it is good to have that kind of a uh, you know target but what does it take to reach that it is achievable only if there is a complete change in the way we teach and do science in this country i am going to restrict to science i hope people with humanities and social sciences don't mind it because my experience is mostly in science so if you want to reach the top we have to the way in which we teach science and the way in which we do science in this country must change how to address the pressing societal but why i am concentrating about science you know if you want to address the problems of society through science what we need to do is that basically we had to promote attract and retain you know these are action words you had to promote you had to attract and you had to retain the new generations of creative and versatile scientists and they should be prepared to participate you know today the challenges are different fast paced information rich collaborative science and one estimate somewhere it said that we require something like 5 million people we have to produce good scientists you know uh, we require the country requires that the second aspect is mend the negative experiences of ug science education you know all of us have come up have studied in colleges and have we did we really get the kind of education what we want and today there are many negative experience of you know which put students away from science we had to overcome that the negative experience of undergraduate science education which is either eroding or the student motivation is turning them away from science altogether when you talk to many several scientists they always remember an undergraduate lecture inspired by someone which actually drove them to do science how many of us can say the same thing today because we require fantastic excellent teachers in the undergraduate science that is very very important the footing has to start from there so how to improve science education in order to increase both student retention and their success in order to do that it is not just you know we do it uh, we start from somewhere we need to start from school we must reform the school science education we need to improve the science curricula and teaching methods we must motivate science teachers attract talent to science through thoughtful schemes we must stimulate research in universities modify organizational structure and develop young leaders in science it is very easy to make you know list i'm i'm not i, I don't think i'm saying anything new which all of you do not know these are all action packed words we need to do that but where do we start you know that is the main crux now the challenges of 21st century are again different you know the 21st century has thrown up a lot of challenges american academy of science they listed the challenges of science in 21st century one is information literacy today we can get lots of information from every way which was not there when we were all going to the schools we had only textbooks and we had only teachers to give information but today information comes to students from all over what is required is they must be informationally literate they must be able to distinguish the good you know the reliable information which can actually teach them something collaboration is a another challenge working together to share advocate and compromise our education system is so much individualistic you know we need to get better marks than 99% of the other person so individually we struggle but when we come to the society we lack the skills to work together because society if there is a company or institution it is teamwork and our education does not teach us how to collaborate communication ability to properly read write present comprehend ideas you know that is uh, very very important um, creativity and innovation you know the, uh, nowadays everybody says you know innovation innovation but we must distinguish innovation from simple improvements unfortunately many people mistake it you know the real meaning of innovation we need to discover exploration of imagination to create something which is not there not improvement incremental improvement you don't call them as innovation that does not lead us any way problem solving ability is very very important we need to teach these kind of skills to the today's students experimentation of new and familiar concepts while using existing information for a viable solution problem solving is the most important you know unfortunately we all get degrees but when we are actually put into the society to solve a problem you know we fail in that so the problem solving ability has to be there and then finally a very important thing is responsible citizenship we all think we are educated but the way in which the society behaves outside 
you know, we all do, you know, uh, we don't show our educative mind in the way in which we behave ourselves, conduct ourselves in the society. Imbibing global awareness, developing moral, ethical capacity in and outside the classroom. So the meaning of education has changed in the 21st you know, century itself. So a very famous quote is, future is not what it used to be. You know, about 20 years back, we could imagine this is the future. But today, it is very, very difficult. And it is not what it used to be. You know, so it is very, very difficult to define what the future is. The world is moving so fast, it's very, very, so it is not what it used to be. Now, how do we start that? Reforming science education and training, it is not at just one level. We need to start right from the school level up to 12th standard, the way in which we teach science, followed by undergraduate level, then the PhD level, postdoctoral level, professional career development, and at the institution level. We need to develop a new way of learning and teaching science and practicing science, very, very important. So how do we do that? Can we just simply go about, you know, put a stick and say and do it? No. One is we must strengthen the existing top institutions, you know, IASCs, IITs, central universities, some state universities, etc. But when you want to bring about a large change in existing institutions, it is not always easy because each institution for right or wrong reasons carries baggage of the past and it is not very easy to change them overnight or even over a period of five years, et cetera. On the other hand, the alternative is to create new institutions which have path-breaking ideas. You know, since, I mean, both the approaches are important, not only where to strengthen the existing institutions, but based on the experience of those things, what has led to them, you know, to their deterioration, we must create new institutions so that we can actually catch up with what is already happening because the old institutions may take a lot more time to catch up. So this is where the second aspect of it, the story of ISIS, they come. Since I have been involved with ISIS in the next about five, 10 minutes, I will tell you about what is that we learned and practiced at ISIS. Where was the need for ISIS? Was there a need? Because when ISIS were created, the existing institutions, all of them for right reason, they said, why we need to invest so much money when we cannot strengthen the existing institutions. But for the same reason, because it is not very easy to solve the baggage, what institutions carry, not always. So the need was to have undergraduate teaching and scientific research. You know, in fact, in our domain, particularly in the universities, undergraduate uh, colleges in the universities, the undergraduate teaching of science and the science research are separated in space and time. What do I mean by space and time? Undergraduate teaching is done in colleges. You know, we are all here because we had some very good teachers in the colleges. We are here today but they don't do research. You know, absence of doing research, uh, you know, not correlating with teaching has a tremendous effect. And similarly, those institutions, we do scientific research. You know, the, uh, we have several national laboratories or even um, our universities which conduct only postgraduate teaching. There the research is done. is not the same as the undergraduate teaching. You know, undergraduate is the one when the school kids, they come, they get exposed. So. Those who do undergraduate teaching were not doing research and those who do active research, they don't teach the undergraduate level. So the teaching and you know, that way, uh, the teaching and research were separated out. You know, that's what is mentioned in here. The research is done in PG universities, national laboratories, there are no undergraduate teaching. And so this slowly led to declining interest in science amongst bright and motivated students. So change the science training at the undergraduate level was very, very important. You know, that is how the ISIS were conceived to bring some kind of a new life into science teaching at undergraduate level. So just one said about the history, what happened was 2002 to 2004, there were several efforts by Professor Govind Swaroop at NCRA Pune and Professor B.G. Pude, Bide, who was the Pune University Vice Chancellor. They wanted to set up National Institute of Science in Pune because Pune was an educational hub. They felt that you know, there are a lot of engineering, some laboratories, et cetera, there. they wanted to bring a National Institute of Science, um, and not only in Pune, to other cities like Allahabad, Chennai, Bhuvaneshwar. In fact, they struggled quite a lot. They went, met the knocked the doors of several ministries, but it was a non-starter. You know, there are documents which say that how much they struggled to bring a modern Institute of Science in Pune, but it was a non-starter. Meanwhile, the government also changed. So in 2005, 
the Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, which was chaired by Professor C.N.R. Rao, to advise the government to set up two IISERs, Pune and Calcutta. You know, although we have several institutions for technology, IITs, engineering college, medicine, etc., we did not have any exclusive brand institutions in science except Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, which is already 100 year old. So that made them think that we must have similar brand institutions in science. To start with, they proposed Pune and Calcutta, which were educational hubs. And in a record time, you know, starting a new institutions today, it may take a year or more than that. But at that point, it was a, a cabinet approved it in a very fast time within about three months. And the first two ISAs were set up in 2006 at Calcutta and Pune, which was followed by Mohali in 2007. And two more came up in Bhopal in Tiruvananthapuram in 2008. So within two years, we had almost you know, um, five ISAs. But from 2008 to 2015, there was a gap. And in the Reorganization Act of Andhra Pradesh gave um, Andhra Pradesh an ISA and the, the then um, minister, the government decided to have this a new ISA at Tirupati, not only an ISA, but also an IIT. This is a very, very unique thing. You know, Tirupati has, is the only city now which has an ISA and an IIT, two institutions of national importance, one for science and one for technology. And Bahrampur was added in 2006. So today we have about seven institutions. There's a little complicated slide just to tell you the locations, you know, they're sort of uniformly located in the north, in the central part, in the west, down south, you know, in the southwest, southeast, etc. Now, as you see here, I have given the sort of pictures of, you know, the founding directors. You know, I started in Pune and Professor Sushanta started in Calcutta. You know, now these are the successive directors. And when the Bahrampur was started, Professor Bhopal was asked to mentor. And uh, when Tirupati started, I was asked to mentor. So these are the people, you know, particularly the founding directors, the first two terms, it's a very, very difficult period. They're the ones who actually has made it possible today what ISERs are. Now, in fact, the, uh, we have a, those who are interested in knowing about science, they can actually go to the, we have a common website, of ISER website, uh, which gives, you know, complete detail. It is one uh, platform from which you can access any of the ISERs to know about, you know, the faculty, students, courses, research, anything about it, you can approach through this one common, you know, website. So this is the ISER common website. Now, other thing also I must say is that in about two years back to in 2018, the founding directors, you know, five of us, we wanted to document what it takes to build a new institution, you know, using ISIS as example. So a book was written, sharing our experiences of building ISIS. And this has been published by Indian Academy of Sciences, edited by Professor Satyamurthy, who was the first director of ISIR Mohali. You know, all of us have contributed chapters to tell about how exactly things happen in the establishment of, you know, ISIS. Now, why, how ISIS are different? Now, the interdisciplinary approach to teaching science, you know, we have a, because science is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary, we are trained in a compartmentalized way. And then when we come to practice, we have to do in an interdisciplinary way. So one approach was to teach science in an interdisciplinary way. And undergraduate programs should be taught by faculty who are active in research. You know, this is another important thing. You know, the gap between the research and the teaching gets reduced when the faculty who are active in research, it can bring the latest research ideas right into undergraduate programs and teach science in a, in a, because of its importance and relevance to life and environment around us, we must you know, teach science not by starting by laws, but look at the society, look at the environment around, take examples and then bring the importance of science into that. To integrate lab experiments to topics that are taught in the classroom lectures. Today morning, you may hear about a you know, simple pendulum hook's law. In the afternoon, you go and do a simple pendulum experiment so you can relate the theory and practice together. So, ISIS were uh, beneficial, you know, because of the uh, unique uh, uh, curriculum, which is established by a group of people. Uh, just one slide about, you know, the first two years, the ISAC concept is the first two years, it is all on the semester basis. We get students from different backgrounds. So we teach them all the common courses. They all have to take physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. Um, uh, so the first two years expose them to the breadth of science. And in the next two years, 
they take advanced courses. By the time they pass two years, they decide whether they want to become a physicist, chemist, maths, or biologist with an informed choice, not based on you know, their uncle, aunt, or grandfather's advice. An informed choice, they choose the specialization and they get the, what you call the depth of science. And in the final year, they do a research. So when they do this integrated BSMS program, they're exposed to the breadth of science, the depth of science, and the research. It is a complete wholesome degree. So this model was introduced in ISAS, which has now been appreciated by very many institutions, even abroad, because when the student comes out of this model, he's exposed to all the different aspects of science. I will not go into that in you know, our syllabus and all that thing. All I want to say is that we need to combine teaching and research. Teaching is done in a compartmentalized way. Yes, we must have, we must teach them the basics of physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, earth and climate science. But today, science is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary. You take any kind of forefront area, you know, chemical biology, nanoscience, they're all at the confluence of two or three different disciplines. This is what we must teach the students, you know, how different disciplines come together to take you to the frontiers. So all the modern areas are at the confluence and your teaching must integrate this concept. So the research on the X or Y axis in the teaching, we need to combine this, I call it as a cloud concept. You know, all the modern areas are like a cloud, they delocalize into uh, different. You know. Then one also should establish several centers of excellence. You know, this is the kind of thing which is more or less followed by several ISAs. Although in Pune, I, we started that, uh, it is not very far off. Many, all the ISAs, they practice this area. You know, we also have centers for excellence to take research into further depth. And then you must have humanities and social sciences. And we also would like to get into some bit of engineering, et cetera. We need to bring them into that. So that is the concept of that. Now, what has ISIS have done that? This was a slide which was made about in somewhere in February, 2020, sort of just to summarize, to give you the impact without going into the combined input. Now, just to tell about till now the investment of uh, in ISIS, where all it has led to. For example, the ISAs together have trained more than about 10,000 students in the BSMS. Our intake is very, very less. And about 4,300 students have, obtained, have been trained for PhD. 3,360 or it should be even more now and uh, awarded PhD degree, just you know some numbers, postdoctoral fellows. The current strength is about close to 9,000 or 10,000 kind of thing strength. And, the total number of faculty here, this, I would like to make an emphasis, you know, till now about 623, I think we still have a gap of about 200, 250 faculty. It is possible to, you know, we need that kind of faculty. Now, one of the thing, all the central universities, IITs, new IITs, new ISERs, you know, NIPERS, et cetera, have made is that our faculty pool has gone enormously in, the, in a very short time of 10 years. I think we must have at least attracted about 3,000 to 4,000 faculty uh, you know, into the pool from abroad, et cetera. That has been a remarkable thing. It has never happened in our history earlier that about 4,000 faculty we have encountered. That if we support them, our research, teaching, everything will reach entirely new heights. Research published papers are more than 10,000. They're all high quality papers. I will not get into the metrics of that. Patents and attracting grants from other agencies. And already ISIS are proving within a short period of 10 to 14 years, they have produced their own in-house Bhatnagar awardees, Swarnajanti fellowships, NARF ranking, fellowships of academies. All, you know, many of these are done by faculty in-house. You know, those after joining ISIS, they've all been able to compete and get these kind of national recognition. That is something. Now, a good thing is also about when ISIS started, we were getting all of our faculty from IAS and IATs now already within a short period, several of the alumnus of ISAS, they're already getting into faculty positions in IACs and IITs. So this is a very short term, you know, remarkable growth in the 10 years because you have to build campus. There are so many things we need to do that in spite of it, that visible output is there. Now, if you look at the world-class level, you know, where do the ISAS figure? I've only chosen what you call as a nature ranking which is essentially based on the research, the world ranking. And 2019, you know, these are the kind of rankings in the nature index ranking among the new institutions that the ISIS have got. Not bad, you know, given within a short period of starting from 10 years, building campuses, recruiting faculty, you know, I think this is a commendable uh, achievement. Another important thing is about the gender ratio. And you could see that the ISIS 
have a very good gender ratio and about the female uh, students, faculty, you know, percentages are quite comparable. And I think it is better than many of the average, you know, in the other institutions, but someday we must reach 50-50%. So that is a, another conscious effort. Now, if you want to remain in the top, what else does it require? You know, you require good faculty, but we need to move into new kinds of courses. The times change, our relevance of our teaching also must change. I've just put in some kind of unusual courses. Maybe some of the other institutions already have, which, you know, several ISIS. If you go to the ISIS website, you will find about those things. For example, physics related courses, you know, from galaxies to molecules, you know, you can, it's all the physics that counts, instrumentation and how to work in the futuristic environment, 5G, 6G. I said Bhopal has this program. Again, in biology, going beyond the conventional biologies, you know, how to teach students right from planets to cells, how biologists operate, how it is important in the society, how stresses, you know, I will not go into the details. You will see that they're all very, very unusual areas which we are concentrating. And for example, in biology, I said Tirupati, we introduced a pandemic science in March, April. You know, telling them about what is a pandemic because, you know, we all got into that regime. So we introduced a new science. So our education should actually go in rhythm with the societal changes. Similarly, you know, whether it's earth and climate science, humanities, social sciences. I said Bhopal actually has started BS in economics and engineering sciences. Slowly, science should be merged into other areas as well. One other thing is about forensic science, which we are doing in Tirupati or food chemistry. So several of these are unusual courses which are not there in many other institutions. One is it brings students into rhyme in the society. The second thing is this also provide them very good career opportunities. There's an issue in that. Now, the way in which you teach science also has to change. For example, emphasis on quantitative skills, connections among biology, chemistry, and physics. And you must align with what is taught in the leading edges of you know, other disciplinary knowledge, and you must develop learning objectives, concept, concepts with more than the, uh, the content. Uh, they should be able to do ab initio thinking, you know, in any of the problems and learning through group discussions, uh, which is interactive. So you have to teach a new way of that. So I've just tried to put in when ISIS graduates, you know, undergraduates, what kind of skill development we do it apart from the scientific content. You know, they must have a broad science in training, specialization in one, interdisciplinary skills, inquiry-based learning, learning by asking questions uh, without memorizing that, innovative lab experiments, research experience, and exposure to modern instrumentation. This is where the research helps. Doing high quality research exposes the undergraduates to modern instrumentation. Not only one has to train them in a science related one, we also must equip them with lifelong competency skills through personality development, communication, presentation skills, problem solving skills, quantitative skills, and teamwork. So our whole education system might incorporate these kinds of you know, concepts into that. Why we need to do is that you know, students are not getting attracted to study pure science. You know, that is what many of us believe because they have got career fears. You know, when they go to a professional degree like um, engineering, management, law, medicine, you know, they can all answer the questions, you know, what is the startup salary they would get, et cetera. But science cannot promise any of those things. But science at the ISIS, we can train students in such a way that wherever they go, they must get a job. Now, more than that, what is important, you know, I use this slide to talk to the parents that not just science, you know, science plus something can produce lots of niche jobs for the society, you know, technical writing, uh, communication, business information, venture capitalists, business, you no, know, number of these things, if you combine science, you know, you can take these, uh, you know, professions, you know, elsewhere, a good basic background in science will help them in getting into all the other professions. So in addition to uh, having good science, if they do a small degree in finance, management, law, journalism, science plus these things can lead them to the fantastic, uh, you know, profession. There are lots of gaps and you know, we do not have people today to even do some bit of small technical writing or communication, you know, patenting thing, etc. So there's a plenty of scope for that. Not only that, you know, we also have to teach the entrepreneurship incubation center. Now ISIS are getting involved. I will not go into the slides. Each of the ISIS have made, you know, have developed facilities to train their graduate students in skill development. Uh, all these things are there. Similarly, 
uh, the research also had to be socially relevant. You know, not only we do it for the scholarship, uh, I will not again go through that, just to give you some representative things that, you know, I said Pune, I said Calcutta, they're doing lots of research at a basic level, which has plenty of immediate societal applications. You know, it's something many people don't realize, you know, that what kind of science is required to really have societal applications. Sometimes uh, you don't request such kind of big basic science is only a translational aspect. In some cases, you require good amount of fair amount of good basic science to do that. And many of the projects which are going on actually involve societies. So ICERs are also very active in program of national importance, whether it's space, atomic energy, high energy physics, you know, and they're also part of very big international big science. Now, what are the challenges, you know, in creation of ICERs? Uh, now, the challenges, you know, which we face because we started myself in Calcutta, you know, we, we, we started Pune and Calcutta. One was we were promoting a new paradigm of science education. So convincing students and parents was not very easy. You know, like, for example, today starting new IITs, NITs, central universities were very easy because already all those institutions are there. ICERs, we never had such institutions. So our first job, challenging job was to convince students and parents. I remember in 2006, myself and Sushanta Dutta, we were talking to about 200 parents, convincing them what, but we cannot promise them moon because science, you know, you cannot promise them anything. So attracting, the second thing was attracting senior faculty, particularly, you know, senior excellent professors, we could never get them. You know, today is a different uh, situation at that point which is very, very key to success is senior faculty having the experienced professors. Many people are already in their comfort zone. They would not move into a new institution where they had to work hard to establish the institution. That was another challenge. And then we had a competition from established institutions, IAS, IATs, you know, how do we counter them? It's not very easy. We are very new kids on the block. So IACs and IATs, you know, attracting either the faculty or students from these institutions was a very big competition. And simultaneously, we had to build a new campus. You know, where we all have to learn how to make a campus, how to architect plans, procedures, everything, financial knowledge, everything, creation of quality transit campus. You know, we all said that we are building a new campus that must get into the 21st century science. You know, quality is an important thing. So, so much of because we want to have advanced research, it requires a lot of very careful infrastructure thing, then we need to do that. And establishing novel academic programs, setting up of enabling administration this is very, very important. We talk about students and faculty, but if the administration is not enabling, you cannot reach any way. We must make it very clear in the institution who exists for whom. And luckily in most of these places, the administration is enabling and creating a new education plus research culture is an important. So as directors, we had these challenges, you know, in the first four or five years, this is what we have shared in that book, how to, uh, you know, overcome these challenges. The leadership challenges are tremendous in establishing new institutions. One is modern science is inter and cross-disciplinary. A very, very important thing, I will elaborate on this in the next slide. The culture of each discipline is different. You know, today we talk about physics, we talk about chemistry, biology, mathematics. All of them do not have the same culture. Unless you understand that culture, you won't be able to build an excellent institution. Requirement of research, necessitates different discipline wise and theory people require different compared to experimental. So any new director must understand the implications of these things. How to create an enabling atmosphere both in teaching and research. We have lots of young faculty who have joined. They do not have teaching experience, but they have to learn about that. You know, there's a fantastic and today I'm glad to say that in ISIS undergraduate, you know, teaching has helped the faculty uh, not only, you know, becoming excellent teachers, understanding the basic concepts, but also in their research. And make sure that the young faculty coming with high energy, they are not, you know, you bring them and give them immediately a lot of administration or ask them to raise funds, that is not very good. And, but we had this lack of competent senior or accomplished faculty, you know, that was another challenge. So these were real challenges, leadership challenges. And attracting competent faculty, if you want to attract, the only way we could attract them was to promise them funds good startup grant because we are starting new institutions. We had to promise them grant, which they would not get in IITs or IASCs, you know, promise them. And in fact, I used to mention that the, when I recruit a faculty, I know what it requires. So almost the startup grant is a blank check. You know, recruiting faculty 
and asking them, giving them limited amount will not help. These are the way in which the modern high quality institutions abroad work. If you want to be competitive, you need to put all these things. The infrastructure had to be built from scratch and I will not go into the details. You know, I can share the slides. The faculty, three to four, an unlimited support you must give for the faculty. When you give it, then only at the end of four years, you have a right to ask them, have you done it right? Have you used that to produce something? Without giving them support, asking you know, at the end of four years or five years uh, during promotion time, that is not fair. We must you know, support them. And then that all gives them a sense of ownership in the institution building. They must feel that it is their institution. You know, they should not come and ask, what is the institute's policy? You know, who makes institute policy? The faculty, you know, what is good for them, they make it. They, they own the institution and develop a sense of sharing resources is very, very important. And now understanding, you know, for any director, if he doesn't understand these things, it becomes very, very difficult. One is, you know, there's a startup grant. We put in money, 20 lakhs. That is not right. You know, you cannot uniformly across because different faculty require different kinds of needs are different, different amounts are needed. So you must understand that. For example, biologists need a very, very large amount for consumables. You know, you cannot apply the same bar market said why you require so much of things. And experimental physicists needs are different. They build instruments. You know, you require a lathe, foundry, workshop for them. You must provide them. Many times that is much more expensive, you know, building instruments. But when they build an instrument on which they can do a one new experiment that sets up the whole trend, you know, that makes a difference. That is important. Chemists need a lot of minor laboratory equipment, major, medium range analytical equipment. Maths requirements are totally different. All they require is a blackboard, books, journals, visitors, and coffee machines. So you must understand the needs of each discipline. Ecologists <laughs> need to go for field trips. So you need to have your budget trained. You must understand this and do that. Uh, can I take another 10 minutes or so? Please, please, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this is a big learning game for any new director. You know, if you operate without understanding the culture of each discipline, we will not be able to. The institute has to move forward. We need to encourage all discipline. This is the greatest lesson that I learned is that, you know, as a director, I must support all the disciplines after having taken them and you must support them in the right manner, what is required for that. Now, what is that ISIS have achieved in the 14 years? You know, I gave you previously some numbers, but today, what is it? You know, ISIS, they're a unique initiative in India where teaching and education are integrated with state of art research. Within a short period of their existence, they have already begun to fulfill the objectives for which they were established. If you go back, you know, what were the objectives and compare with today's status, I think they're slowly, they're, you know, uh, achieving those objectives. Because all of us have state of art campuses, high quality training of undergraduates in research ambience, excellent research publications, high ranking in national, international prestigious professional recognitions, um, attracting competitive research grants. Uh, this is a little bit slow, but industry will not come, you know, unless we are established. Somewhere we are doing some societal relevant projects and outreaching and networking. Many ISAs are doing excellent thing because we realize that school education is important. Many of the ISAs are actually reaching out to the local schools and networking with them, um, both the teachers and team. Now, where do ISAs go? One is ISAs have to go after 14, 15 years now expansion going beyond the original objectives. We must now look for newer um, you know, objectives, uh, depending upon where the world is moving. We must concentrate on skill development and we must go international. You know, I will, maybe I will have a later on slide about the importance of international uh, in terms of education. And we need to generate a lot of industry and collaborative R&D programs and also get involved in transformation and translation. So after establishing the basic skills, I think ISIS now had to move into the newer uh, domains. The creating new research areas, you know, like for example, these days in atmospheric space science, you know, space science is coming up in a very, very big way. Space biology is very, very important. Quantum technologies, cryptography, cybersecurity. You know, here there is a, the, interfer the interface between engineering and science just disappears. Circular chemistry, sustainability, there are lots of challenging and if you want to get into these ones, education becomes very, very important. We need to start teaching these courses into the undergraduate level. If you do that, 
five years down the line, we'll have professionals you know, in these things. You know, that is very important. Any new area comes you know, abroad, immediately they do investment in education because today, if you put in education five years down the line, you will have professions, professionals who practice that. It is very, very important. Now, in the last part, I will ask these questions. We all talk about world class. Do we know what a world class means? What makes sense to do world class? You know, everybody says world class, excellence. Are we just talking in the air or do we realize what it takes? For example, is it the buildings, the facilities, you know, the area, beautiful aesthetics? Is that what makes world class? Yes, excellent equipment is necessary. They should have state of art laboratories, libraries with modern information acquisition and management systems. Of course, these are a must. You know, I have spent three years in Cambridge, which is a, you know, 800 year old, but within the same buildings, they have adopted all these new things, you know. Now only a new Cambridge has started, but the ability to adopt your existing structures to introduce new things is very, very important. Infrastructures or building, of course, they are a must, but they're not sufficient condition for becoming excellent. Excellence is defined, as I said earlier, defined by the quality of the minds. The quality of the minds are working in the institutions. World-class minds, both faculty and students who work sustainably in it. They're the important. They are the ones who really bring the world-class to the institutions, provided you have the point number one, which is the infrastructure. Now, what next? We must have outstanding people, you know, faculty and students, both. Commitment to high quality of education. You know, pedagogy must be taken seriously. Teaching must be taken. You cannot be a single word in research because it gives you papers. It gives you a quantifiable thing. No, most universities, you take them, their undergraduates are very famous. They all, each of the professors at the universities, they go and teach the first year undergraduates. You know, that's what we should be doing. The best of the people should be teaching the first year students to excite them. High quality education commitment should be there in these institutions. Focus on research excellence underpinned by an international open outlook. As I said, it's not good to be within the state or the, within the country. Our research, when you go it, it should be really a global excellence. You know, there is no excuse there. We cannot say that we didn't have that, we didn't have that, etc. But you must find a way of, you know, reaching the global excellence. But these things, what is most important, which most people have not realized, unfortunately, in our country is, sustainable funding. If the funding is not sustainable, if it's only a you know, two year funding and nothing else suddenly stops, it will not happen. Irregular, infrequent flow of funds will not help excellence, developing institutions. It has to be a sustainable funding to ensure excellence and access. International peer reviewing is a must. We must subject ourselves to international peer reviewing. And unfortunately, endowments, you know, it's only very recently perhaps, but a lot of our private institutions, you know, the, the philanthropy is lacking in India. It is really lacking, you know. I think if they have money, they will start their own universities rather than, you know, supporting good programs in very good universities. It is good to have private universities, but I think philanthropy must take root in India. You look at Stanford or Harvard, most of those, you know, if you look at the faculty profile of any of the abroad universities, every assistant professor is has an another position, chair of something, endowed by some company, some etc. Every even assistant professor level, you know, unfortunately we don't have that in India. You know, we are not at that stage. Importance of organizational leadership. You know, academic organizational structure is very important, and we must learn how to manage academics. You know, managing intellectuals is not very easy. So it requires a completely different kind of setup because intellectuals they will have diverging views. Each one may be right. How to manage them is not, you know, we must learn to do that. We must have the visionaries, you know, these leaders to create the future. Future is not, it is there, we will reach, it is not that. You must create it actually, the future. Harboring interdisciplinary cultures, right type of humanities and social sciences is something which is not yet practiced in science institutions, but that has a lot of scope and we must do that. What kinds of social sciences should be taught in science institutions that is important? As most of you know, many technologies, although they are good, they did not succeed because they had not understood the social behavior of people. You know, they never used those technologies. Very important. Creating spaces for everyone's mind enrichment. You know, we recruit faculty. The system must be able to get the best out of the faculty. You know, I'm sure everyone has something, mind enrichment. 
how to get the best out of them. And most important thing is the sense of ownership should be there. The faculty, students, and the staff. It is not that me and the institute, you know, and the management, it is not like that. The whole institution, we must always use the word we, we, we. You know, we are a part of it. That sense of ownership must come into all these institutions. That is because, you know, two things are very, very simple. Country in which educated and healthy, that is the mind and the body, you know, the healthy people live, knowledge, economic prosperity will automatically follow. Unfortunately, education and the health are the two sectors where there is always the first budget cut happens from the government. You know, education and health, if you are educated and you are a healthy person, education of the right type I'm talking about. And a healthy person, rest of it will automatically follow. Unfortunately, we are not realized that. I hope our present pandemic will bring some bit of thing, you know, at least the pandemic has brought us, you know, importance of health and the government is investing, you know, in uh, to prevent future things in health. Similarly, education, at least the value of science is being now recognized in terms of either vaccine development or the social behavioral thing, etc. So very, very important. Investment will never go waste if you put it in education and health sectors. Now, what is the role of academic leaders? I think I might be repeating some of them. I will probably skip this thing. What I want to emphasize is that the end product of education should be character and abilities, not you know, the jobs and the careers. That is a byproduct. Now, commitment to high quality education, uh, dynamic curricula should be there, interdisciplinary teaching, research orientation, inquiry-based learning, we have to incorporate many of these things into the way in which we teach. For example, can you teach by solving problems rather than telling them formulas and then ask them to solve problem? You take a problem while solving problem, can you teach them? Lifelong competency skills. And an important thing is which we'll never be able to administer or is how to evaluate students beyond examination. You know, now exams, I think most of the academic structure, academic function in our country hinges on two things, admission and exams. If you can do that without causing court cases, I think you have succeeded as an institution. That's unfortunate. But can we evaluate students beyond examination? That is something I know we need to learn about. Participation in globe and R&D structure. If you want to be internationally competitive, there are several big sciences going on. We should become part of that. You know, modern science is increasingly resource intensive. And if you become a part of the big global R&D infrastructure, you'll be able to get funding and you'll be at the forefront, you know, at the emerging technology is something which some of our you know, institutions should do that. A serious impediment for us in working in India is absence of postdoctoral culture in India. You know, it is difficult in India uh, to become globally competitive. All of us have done postdoctoral work. We know we go to the West, we have postdoctoral work and come back. And when we come back, we are different. The postdoctoral fellowship has taught us something different. We are different, you know, to pursue our independent research. But unfortunately, all the academicians are working in India. We don't get the benefit of good postdoctoral students. The mm -hmm. best of our students go abroad and we don't get that thing. So many of our academics have to compete without the strength of postdoctoral students. You know, abroad, fantastic work happens, all contributed by postdoctoral students, you know, who come with prior training, they take up challenging problems, they work. But this is something which we are not realized. How to develop a good postdoctoral, compete, competent postdoctoral program. And we are, we are, you know, it's actually just, you know, put us a little bit back into our thing because we are not beneficiaries of good postdoctoral program. Many people who joined, you know, we don't blame them. They're always insecure. They have to look for the job next one. They won't be able to sort of really concentrate on the challenging the problem. It is, short, it is scant or even absent. Um, so by giving money, can you attract, uh, you know, more postdoctoral? I know I doubt by giving any amount of money you give, you may not get good postdoctoral fellows because they don't come for money. They go for training, job security are important. You know, that is very, very important. Maybe we should improve their career prospects by door telling them into Ramanujan, Ramalinga Swami fellowships, etc. Sustainable funding is very, very important. World-class universities require sustainable funding. We should not worry about what happens to me next month or next year. You know, that is very, very important. Now, given the way in which our budget is structured, we get funds every month, you know, not even for a quarter. So that puts a lot of insecurity in us. How to attract private endowments, a philanthropy, which is totally absent in India. 
you know, because if you get philanthropy, you can attract great professors by creating chairs, you can build cutting edge facilities, you can provide financial aid to scholarships to attract, because government alone cannot support everything. We must be clear about that. Government cannot give all these things. So our society must pitch in uh, into these uh, kind. So excellence in universities, as in virtually everything else, has a cost. This is what we not, you know, we don't realize that. Everybody says, so, you know, what have you done? Why you're not excellent? Why your ranking is that? In India, we never look at input-output ratio, unfortunately. We are only worried about the output number. <laughs> but what is the cost? We must realize, as everything in, else in society, excellence has a cost. If you don't pay that cost, you cannot become excellent. Heads of world-class universities, I have seen, their main job is to raise money from uh, you know, the private, you know, et cetera. But unfortunately, in India, we, we have the absence of that. You know, most of the time, we all will be signing CL, EL, and you know, working about RTIs, et cetera. We never get time to or really think about the, you know, the long-term vision of that. So we had to undergo a serious change in our organizational structure. Now, I have just about two or three slides to finish. The national education policy, we have rolled it out. So I must mention something about that. The good policy document is a good policy document for future education. I have read once, twice. It all has right things and it all says the right things. It has recognized lots of bottlenecks and it also provides solution. It, provides, it promotes meritocracy at all levels, recognizes all stakeholders, what is their interest. It promotes interdisciplinary research. It also promotes internationalization. Overall, it's a very fantastic document, not only at the school level, at the et cetera, but it is a very idea, you know. In fact, what I want to say was that many of the ICERs, you know, when we started, we already had incorporated some of them, which we which very easily we aligned to the NEP 2020 goals. But the challenge is the implementation of that. You know, it is a very ideal document, but the practically how do you implement, there are serious challenges. One is conflict of interest from different stakeholders. How to avoid the conflict, you know, if you want to do something, but something else in the document comes in the way. So how to wade your way through without you know, getting this uh, conflict. Disting we must distinguish institutions in terms of support and regulation. We must have institutions which impart general education for masses. You know, we require equity, we require affordability, we require accessibility of education. All this is very, very important. National education policy makes a very big, uh, you know, um, argument for that, which is really important because it is these things that make us good citizens. Institutions, so this must be for the general education. But what we should not forget is that we must not apply the same kind of support and regulation thing to institutions that promote scholarship, institutions which want to be at excellence global level, institutions which has to be a world-class research at global level, world-class, that institutions you must have a little bit different standards of support and regulation. In fact, you should not regulate them at all. If they can't self-regulate, then they can never become institutions of eminence. So leave them out. So we must practice this education policy, although it has certain you know, things, but we must distinguish these two kinds of institutions. We should not apply the same you know, uh, bar uh, to all of them. So that is important. Now, the merits of, so how do you prove that? You're a successful institution. You know, now we have so much of metrics, you know, NARF ranking, NIAC, et cetera, everything combined to the numbers. We are, we are getting into the triviality of those numbers. But if, I'm only talking about institutions, excellent institutions. You must simply ask, do the best of the student, do they come here to the institution? Is that institution a first choice for, even, you know, for the students, the mm -hmm. best of the students? Mm -hmm. Can we attract the best from anywhere? Can we attract the best faculty from anywhere? You know, if you can attract the best faculty, you know, that's what I was giving you the example of Princeton, where best of the students go there because they have the best of the teachers and best of, you know, many good teachers want to join because they get best of the students. You know, I think. So do the best want to come here? Can we attract the best from anywhere? Do the best want to hire our products? You know, where all our people are going? Are they going to the best of the places? You know, these things, you should go away from the triviality of numbers and try to judge the, you know, thing. Publications, patents, application research, should these be the goals of assessment? Yes, to some extent, yes, they do reflect. To some extent, they are, you know, they can be the goals of assessment, 
But what is happening is that these metrics, an important thing is these metrics should be the consequence of science, but unfortunately they become the goal of science in our institutions. They have to be the consequence of science. You are doing so many excellent things. All these things will happen naturally, but we do the other way around. We go and judge these things. So the metric should be the consequence of science rather than the goal of science itself. If the numbers, if you want to achieve it, there's several ways in which we can do that. That should not become our goal itself. Then you can really be excellent. But the sad part of our educational management, I'm sure this is in many places, but at least is national education policy and all of us raise the bar. You know, every day you increase the raise the bar. We must do this, we must do this, we must do that. But unfortunately, we lower the budget. On one hand, we cut the budget. On the other hand, we raise the bar. How do we bring a balance <laughs> that is really a very, very challenging thing. So, so this way I would like to stop and I hope I have given you some glimpse of thinking about excellence in a much broader context. There are a lot of ground reality problems in a country like us. I'm not taking it away. I'm not saying that this is a mantra for everything, but this has to be at the back of our mind. What is excellence? What is world class? Oh. What are the ways of reaching them? We need to think in those things. So I must thank uh, at this stage people who gave me the opportunity to become the director because with this thing, you know, I have not shared several of my other experiences of building real buildings of the institutions, you know, and how to develop but academic programs, the research culture, etc. So I've been very, very uniquely lucky to be the founding director of two institutions. You know, I have learned quite a lot. I am really thankful to the people who gave me that opportunity. And I also, I must thank the past and the present directors of ISIS. You know, we all work as a team. Today, we have seven ISIS. When I started the first year, we were only two directors. Then we became three, then we became five. And we all have been moving together. And I must thank the MHRD has given us tremendous support, you know, to, uh, in the building, etc. In particular, I had to thank uh, Professor Satyamurti, who was the director of ISIS Mohali, and Professor Vinod Singh who was the direct founding director of ISER Bhopal. I think we have shared so many things, you know, arguments. In fact, some of the contents of these slides also have been derived from many of our discussion with, you know, particularly Professor Satyamurti and Vinod Singh. I must thank them and the colleague ISER directors, you know, who were there in 2007 to 2013, who helped shape the ISERs during formative years. And it was not, as I said, it was not an easy thing to bring a, uh, some kind of a, you know, what you call today ISIS enjoy a status. It is not very easy to give a shape. And uh, we had to work what you call as a contra thermodynamic in a way. And, but it, it all has helped us. And today we're glad to see that plenty of good number of students are aware of ISIS system. They would like to join. And many students who have come out of the system are going and doing elsewhere very good. I would strongly recommend those who are interested, you know, to read this book, the story yeah, yeah. of ISIS we wanted to document the, uh, the pains and the pleasures that we went through in building these institutions. And of course, it is a rich uh, you know, uh, book with all the experience you know, documented in that. Uh, with these things, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Maybe I did uh, you know, overshoot time. Uh, no, 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 it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, thank you very much sir. It's an excellent presentation. So now I uh, invite uh, Dr. Sabay Sakshi Chakravarti for Department of Chemistry to take up the questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, sir. This really been a wonderful and informative session. And we're really honored to listen to you on your experience on, I mean, how you can you build excellent institutions. So we have many interesting questions we have, but due to time positive, we would like to take a couple of those, I mean, questions. And also I'd like to request those uh, participants that uh, we would like to unmute you so that you can ask your question directly to Professor Ganesh. So the first question is uh, from uh, Mr. Prashant Ratna Parkhi. Uh, Dr. Mulli, could you kindly unmute? Uh, uh, it's, uh, sir, can I be heard? Yes, yes. yes. I can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, sir, thank you for organizing such a wonderful talk. And it, it was a brilliant uh, lecture uh, talking about institutions and also institutions of high repute, which are coming up in India. So my question basically is to confer, actually check why have uh, institutes which are of higher learning in India uh, wanting to bring in humanities uh, within the domain of science where <laughs> things like IIT and ISER or 
IIC Bangalore are known for hardcore sciences. It's a very welcome thing, but I would just like to know, ask your opinion and your uh, thinking on this. Sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, social science is very important. You know, science finally, science gets converted to the technology, and technology will be used by people. Science. So, if we do not understand the this the social science aspect of it, you know, what does the people want? The very, it's not very easy to change the janta, the mass. So whatever new we want to introduce, we must understand their psyche and develop, you know, even a simple thing, for example, toilet, you know, I mean, this is told to me by, it is not very easy to develop a new toilet, you know, I mean, in Swachh Bharat, if you don't understand the, the background of the people, you know, at the village, the way in which they go and use public toilet, because in the, in the public field, when they go there, there are a lot of uh, social interactions happen, you know, in addition to the whatever thing, and many of them, they go there for that. And you know, compartmentalizing, they found that many people were not using toilets. You know, it's just a very, may not be an apt example. What I'm saying is that social sciences is important. The way in which we are human beings, society is made, is society results from the human behavioral psychology. So we must, any sometime new technologies will fail if it is not tuned to the way in which, you know, the science. So social sciences is very important. In fact, it is called social science. You know, the science word comes there. It is not something non-science. It is a science aspect. So it is very important, particularly in the technology institutions, even. The second thing I would like to give is, for example, uh, no, we are, let us say, how uh, social science can be used to science. Now, if I take all these famous scientists, I read their biographies. You know, as a literature, I read their biographies. And you find that those people, they were all just like any one of us, common people. How did they become great? You know. If you look at it, you study their biography, how they were, you know, they were living, etc. So that gives us a lot of confidence that commoners can become, you know, a, the societal setup. If you understand it, it will be a very, very important thing. Reading biographies of scientists, how anyone could, you know, reach that level. So some bit of humanity, social sciences, understanding the psychology, etc., is important. I'm not saying that that is a vital thing, you know, for this. Uh, it is good to know. Not only is in a broad context, you know, something about music. Music has a lot of science in that. Arts, we can teach science uh, using paintings. You know, I myself have done that. There are several things, you know, mathematics, science, all reflects in other aspects of society. So to bring science to the society, that helps. Or for example, environment. You know, you go and uh, see how the people are practicing in villages, um, you know, their eco-friendly systems, they're practicing, etc. Many of them may have a real scientific meaning. So to bring those aspects, the other important thing is the way in which the you know, research in social science is done is different from the way in which we collect data in science. The two different things are there. So it's important, you know, that will help to some aspect, then we really become more humane, you know, then we don't get disconnected with society. And so that extent, it is important to learn the right kind of social sciences which is important for you know, the undergraduate uh, discovery. Like for example, we have a course called so biology and society. You know, when you go to the real society, we'll find that there are a lot of scientific meaning. How do you bring science into society? That is possible if you understand how the society behaves, how the society acts, that will be helpful. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. So it's asked by Mr. Prabhat Kumar Swain. So, Dr. Mulli, could you kindly unmute? Yeah, Parvati can talk. Hello? Yes. Hello, yes. sir? Yes. Yes. We can uh, sir, a very, very nice, sir. Excellent presentation. My best regards to you, sir. Uh, my question is, why there is a decline in interest among bright and talented young minds for science at present context yes. in India? How to motivate them more and more towards science? You know, it has to start by at the teaching level, you know, at the school level, undergraduate level, you get, you know, what is science? Science is about asking questions about natural world, you know, about the nature, about the natural world. Science cannot ask questions about unnatural world. You know, science cannot ask about is there a life after death or what is the, you know, uh, witchcraft. So science cannot answer many of those unnatural phenomena. Science can answer only about natural phenomena. So to teach science, you take examples of natural phenomena, something around you, and then teach science. The way in which we teach science has to change. Uh, you know, not just formulae, books, memory, etc. 
So we have to take something which is happening in a natural world, tell them how interesting, and then bring the science in that. Then that will have so you can bring more and more talented students into science, provided the way in which you teach science has to change. For that, teaching pedagogy has to change. There is no single method. I cannot say that, you know, for example, if you want to teach botany, sitting in a classroom and showing any number of pictures will not help. Take them to your field, show them the plants, flowers, tell them, they get more excited, right? So each area you have to develop how innovatively you can, you know, uh, teach about that. You know? So first of all, you have to raise their curiosities about natural world. If you were teaching can bring that in, in, in even in informal way, you know, that is good. Then take them and tell them why something is happening, etc. So if you bring that, I'm certainly, you know, they, there are very bright students, you know, uh, the thing we cannot say that all good students are going away from science, etc. cetera. Uh, <laughs> India is a big country, you know, and uh, even a small number percentage is a big number. We have plenty of students. I must tell you my recent experience, we have been interacting for the past uh, uh, almost about six months with a, with a group of Navodaya school students, you know, who are very bright from sixth standard to 10th standard. And the way in which we interact, you know, through Agastya Foundation is remarkable. The kind of questions they ask, you know, is remarkable. So, and when you interact with them, when you answer, when you, you know, become one among them, they, they get excited. So it has to start for that, you could require good teachers, you know, you require good teachers. Unfortunately, teaching is the last profession. When you don't get any job, they get into teaching. You know, that's uh, because of various things, maybe because of salary, because of social stigma, whatever it is, you know, the teaching profession is such lovely and noble. So if you can bring good people, in, there are several selfless, you know, people who have been teaching. So we must encourage teaching at the school level. If you do that, by the time they come to undergraduates, give them a little push, you know, they would certainly. You see that several people who get dissuaded here, they go abroad and do extremely well. It is the environment that pushes people to their best of their abilities. You know, it is the environment. So we have to create such environment where even an average person does extremely good. A good person does fantastically better. You know, we have to improve the environment of that. Yeah. Okay, sir. We go to the next question, which is asked uh, by Mr. Uh, Jaswant P. So, Dr. Mulli, could you kindly yeah, unmute? Yes, sir. Can talk, Ashwan. Hello. Yes. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes. this is a pleasureful uh, uh, moment for all of us who are sitting at the back. The thing is, uh, the SRM University is organizing the most inspiring people who inspire science from the common man also. I'm uh, working as a back-end research person. That's why I'm asking this question. Uh, is there is any university or institute that identifies and promotes a research attitude and opportunity for the working professionals who is working at the back? Who might be having a better idea or some, maybe I did not say it is better idea, some uh, idea which can be implemented. And uh, science and research for common man who is at the bottom line, bridge goes to them and to pursue career for science. Is there any opportunity, sir? Yeah, you know, it's very difficult to pinpoint and say, you know, this is what you should do, research opportunities that way. One can help them to see the research methodology, not the opportunities. If you want to do research, what are the things? How do you go about doing research, methods of science, etc.? Um, but much of the things, you know, research is something highly individualistic. You pick it up. You know, it is very, very difficult to create a program for or, or write a program for creativity. You know, you cannot create an artist if something comes within you. In a way, research scientists are also creative people, they're also artists. They create something which is not existing, you know, that aspect. You cannot program somebody, you know, uh, you do this, 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 you will get, you know, that is very, very difficult. So we can provide opportunities. The best thing is, uh, you know, they should go visit certain research institution, provide them, a, you know, maybe they can go and visit for two weeks, three weeks. I mean, let us forget about this COVID time and physical thing is uh, difficult. So we can provide the backend researchers to go and visit some institutions. I think there are already, there may be some programs like that by DST, DBT, et cetera, short term visits to uh, good institutions. You know, you go there, spend about three weeks, four weeks, interact with people. You will get to know, you know, about different things. You may pick up one or two ideas which you can do in at your place. So that kind of opportunities, it is possible, you know, to do that. And some such things are happening perhaps, but maybe it should be, you know, encouraged. I think in the new education policy may provide, I think, somewhere that how to, 
imbibe, you know, these kind of people, expose them to newer thing. Um, for example, you know, some of the teachers who have been teaching, they can go and spend some time in a small research institution uh, just to get ideas, you know, like how it is done. For example, can we do teaching itself? You know, can every experiment, a normal laboratory experiment, can be done as a research project? In a research project, what do you do? Define a problem, then you start collecting the data and finally interpret the data and understand the basic principle. On the other hand, many of our experiments, we tell them, you take five microliters, 10 micro, you do this, you do this, etc. On the other hand, you convert each of them into a research kind of thing. You don't know what is that. You do this, how do you design an experiment, an undergraduate experiment? So even at an undergraduate level, that research element, you know, how to think about things which are unknown, how to go about things can be introduced even at a micro level. You know, that all requires some bit of creativity. That's the reason the teacher becomes most important, you know, thing. So unless we value the teacher, train the teachers, that is very, very important. You know, training the teachers is very, very important. Then automatically things will, you know, follow. You teach, you train one teacher, that teacher trains 100 students, you know, that has an amplification effect. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I, as I said, there are many interesting questions, but uh, we'd like to go to the very last one which is another again and very interesting uh, question asked by V. Madhurima. So, Dr. Murli, could you kindly? Madhurima, you can talk. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, Professor Ganesh. This is Madhurima from Central University of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it was a very nice talk uh, listening to you. My question is, how do you sustain the vision for excellence when the leadership changes subsequently, and also when newer faculty come who don't get the vision. Yeah. See, vision, you know, when you say institute vision, that is different from uh, the actual day to day, whatever they do, research, et cetera. Yes, you know, this is a, the, what you asked is a very important thing. When the leadership changes, when the management changes, several things change. Uh, I must share, you know, I have been, uh, before joining ISAR, I was working in a CSI laboratory. And uh, many of these national laboratories have this thing, you know, each director or the director general or whomsoever comes, he comes with his own vision. In his five years, he wants to implement it. When the next one comes, he changes the whole direction because the country's policies may change, etc. That is not good. See, today, ISRO, Atomic Energy and Space Program, they fantastically succeeded in India. Everybody acknowledges them because they had this long-term range, you know, they knew whichever government comes, whichever director general comes, their programs don't change. You know, that was, that's all those, of course, they have to be done in such kind of a mission program or maybe agriculture, etc. But when it comes to science institutions and things, you know, we keep on changing our policies. So we must have some things long running you know, uh, programs running and uh, it is very important. It does happen. So we must see how we, for example, adopt ourselves to those changes. You know, that is a challenging thing at the grassroots level, at the scientist level. Today you are doing something, you put all your heart and you solve something. Uh, next day, you know, after four years, somebody else comes and says, you leave it and go. See, in order to do science, what is important is emotional involvement. You know, it's very important. Unless I get emotionally involved in the problem, I get convinced about a problem, I will not be able to solve. So, to come and define a problem and uh, you solve it. It doesn't happen. So you have to get interested in the problem. So we had to devise mechanisms by which the right kind of problem, you know, the person gets emotionally involved in a problem. You know, that is very, very important. Uh, it cannot be done like a job. Today you're given a job and you know, you do it, tomorrow another job comes, etc. Research is not that kind of a job. So to some extent, we need to define our longer objectives. Every institution must have doesn't matter, next 10 years, this is what we want to do. To give an example, for example, you know, let's say about five or 10 years back, uh, you know, we all knew water is a problem, drinking water is a problem, energy is a problem, we knew for 10 years. Suppose institutions put, put a goal, in about 10 years, I would you know, like to have this gadget, water purification system. You know, I'm going to, within 10 years, I'm going to build a, uh, you know, things like this, or energy like this, then, when the whole institute works for that. Sometimes you may have to use physics, sometimes you have to, or a drug delivery. I want to find a drug for tuberculosis in the next 10 years. If that becomes a mission, then you can use all modern science, you know, including bioscience, everything to solve towards one goal-oriented project. So we should have such goal-oriented projects, which the day on which we dissolve it does 
bring you one. Many times we spread too thin and many of them are for short range problems and they come, they disappear, they're not. Uh, so there is a lot of thing one has to do about this, you know, plan management research. See, one of the things which we do not have, I did not mention about this, science policy. You know, in uh, United States and UK, there are science policy bodies, you know, who frame these policies, what kind of areas we should work on in the next five years or 10 years. They foresee that and they start seeding it today. Unfortunately, in India today, you know, we, we join too late and we put too little resources. That's the reason we have not been able to make a good impact, you know. So that is, I think. So the question what you ask is very important and uh, I have no answer to that. You know, a system <laughs> should have for that, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, sir, thank you very much. And uh, it's really been privileged to hear you and over to you, uh, Vinod. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank you. So now I uh, invite our uh, respected uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor D. Narayan Rao, uh, to present a virtual memento to our distinguished speaker. I request our distinguished speaker to accept the memento. Okay. That, Dr. Vinod. Yes, sir. Uh, before presenting the memento, I am tempted or forced to talk for about 90 seconds. I hope you know the convener allows me. Please, sir. Please. Uh, sir, Dr. Ganesh, sir, some of us are hypnotized. I am yet to come out of that. And I am trying to come out of that. Perhaps it may take a few hours more. As you rightly said, Nalanda and Takshasila. Nalanda produced scholars of the highest quality for many centuries, and many of them changed world's history. That's how we have to build institutions in this country, maybe in the next few decades or so. Also, you mentioned about Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and Stanford University. They're able to maintain their leadership in the global educational institutions as they appoint high quality faculty and admission of quality students. These features are able to keep them at the esteem of the academic institutions in the world. Sir, here at SR University AP, we scout and attract high quality faculty who have obtained their PhDs from premier institutions from India and abroad, and all of them have international experience or international exposure. And we could attract four DST inspired faculty members, one David Ramang, some fellow, and also very recently, one Dr. Sudar Sen got DBT Welcome Trust Early Career Research Award. And many of our faculty members published and are publishing in uh, Nature, Science, PNAS, etc. Thus, we for emphasize on quality faculty and our admissions are only on the base of merit. Nothing else works here at SR University AP, though it's a private university. So regarding establishing new institutions, as you rightly mentioned, it was a right option to uh, initiated by Dr. Govind Swaroop and Bide in uh, starting ISERS. Of course, as you said, it couldn't take off for some time. I was involved in discussions with the director, the then director of uh, GMRT, that is Dr. Govind Swaroop. So I'm fully aware of the conceptualization of ISERS. Now ISERS, the newly established institutions have attained the global reputation in a very short period. It's a remarkable achievement of ISERS and people who led these ISERS like Professor K. N. Ganesh. Sir, here at SRMAP, we have the privilege of establishing a greenfield university. We don't have the baggage. We are privileged to have this uh, greenfield university and our management encourages us to develop. Now, I take this opportunity to request and solicit Professor K. N. Ganesh for his kind support and guidance in developing this nascent SRM University into an institution of eminence in the years to come. 
so we will be grateful to you for your kind support and guidance uh, that's why our management invited you to join the our governing body we look forward to your kind help so now i'll try to come out of uh, hypno <laughs> hypnotism maybe by tomorrow morning <laughs> okay thank uh, you and now now i take this privilege to present a virtual memento to professor ganesh for his distinguished talk which uh, i'm sure from the questions i see many of the participants got motivated and inspired and professor ganesh has directly said to the government we have to sustain a science policy today morning i was discussing with somebody when isro and atomic energy are able to maintain their missions why not other institutes same thing professor ganesh mentioned sir thank you very much we are obliged to you yeah. okay thank you thank you all thank you sir. thank you very much sir so uh, now i uh, invite uh, dr sabesh sakshi mukhopadhyay uh, to conclude hello sir hello hello yes sir so hi good evening sir i am sabesh sakshi mukhopadhyay from department of physics srm university ap amravati sir so it is my pleasure to present a vote of thanks for our seventh university distinguished lecture at srm university ap amravati sir first i would like to thank uh, you as uh, uh, for your enlightening talks and when you share your knowledge and experience to build up a new university within india okay this webinar was full of interesting ideas what you have developed on how to build a world class education institutes at india so your you this provide us a deep insights into the topic and also revealed some of the interesting facts on how to integrate science with the society with uh, through a teaching of a new pedagogy also combining basic and advanced research with the management skill and the skill based education and along with encouraging private endorsements in challenging research which we are missing in indian system sir as you mentioned i have still remember during i have interaction session with a nobel prize winner at iisc he mentioned that a scientist has been developed in at school level it's not from a, a university laboratories so that's culture we need to have developed within india and i think the new education policy will help us to develop that so, uh, sir uh, the precious knowledge what you have shared with us it will be very helpful for our future as a young faculty members and also from the students community of a newly established university we all want to follow your advices and ideology and hope said within a, uh, being a part of a world class university in future and maybe said within a few years as a member of a governing body of our university we hope that we able to su successfully it, we reach our team within a very soon sir once again on behalf of all the participants of this webinar i want to thank you for providing us your time from your busy schedule and enlightening us with your experience to to how to develop institutes not only institute a world class universe institutes within india sir thank you sir for your talk sir thank sir at the end i would like to thank our vice chancellor sir pro vice chancellor sir of our srm university ap and also the university management sir to support and to support us in organizing university distinguished lecture series so this we are completing the seven lecture series of uh, which is started from uh, october this month sir also i would want to thank all the webinar committee who really worked very hard to make this webinar even successful I want to thank all the participants from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Indian Institute of Science, National Institute of Technology (ISRs), and different research centers of all over the India, several Indian universities, and not only from the abroad also for joining 
our SRM University AP Distinguished Lecture Webinar Series. Thank you to all. Once again, I just want to remind to all the participants to join our next University Distinguished Lecture. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. sir. Hmm, Ranjit, kuch na kuch bolo. <laughs> so, congratulations to the entire organizing team. Very, very yeah, yeah. excellent. <laughs> today you are not having that interaction. Sir, sir? Normally you used to yeah. have this time. I, I, wish, I wish faculty members come forward and asking. Okay. Instead of my imposing that on them, <laughs> I thought that is. I thought I will. <laughs>